right, if you will, grab your Bible, turn to Job 27. Job chapter 27, and we'll go further in the services uh, with our study of the book of Job. Uh, Justin will not be here tonight because he's sick. Uh, one other thing, be praying for Brother Bill McCrickard, who is uh, about to be 90 years old, and they're planning on having surgery on his uh, intestines on... Uh, on Friday, Lord willing, they're trying to work him in. Uh, he's at the hospital now. Uh, we went by and saw him last night. So please uh, keep him in your prayers. Uh, the other thing, Valentine's Day banquet. How many times are you on your phone and yet you can't get on and sign up? Uh, how rough is this? All right, get on, go to the website, sign up. It's going to be the best night of your life, trust me. You, if you leave this up to your husband, you're going to have a horrible night on Valentine's Day. Just talk him into this. The other thing that we requested, we want pictures from you from the 90s. If you were born in the 90s, fine, bring them. Married in the 90s, graduated high school in the 90s, having kids in the 90s, old in the 90s, I don't care what it is, get them in to Alexis. So uh, let's definitely remember that. So Job 27 in your Bible. And uh, Job 27 is where we're going to be at. Now, let me kind of remind you as where we're at in this book. Now remember, we've had this three-punch system of his three friends. Elihu, uh, Eliphaz, uh, Bildad. Uh, and, and Zophar, excuse me, not Elihu, he shows up in a little bit. Uh, but these three friends are each taking a turn to punch on Job. Job rebuttals and comes back, and this has been going on the third round. And all of a sudden, uh, Bildad spoke in chapter 25 with, with you know, six rhetorical questions, and Job basically starts in chapter 26, and we're now in 27. He's going to go all the way to 31, uh, uh, basically rebutting them. And so the bottom line is, can you imagine, and I know I keep going back here, but I want your brain or your mindset to get there. I don't know how many kids you have, but can you imagine tonight you getting a phone call that every kid you have has died. And then in the morning you get up and your bank account is flat empty. Everything you've had has been repossessed. You are without nothing. And then your spouse walks up to you and says, why don't you just curse God and die? And yet you still don't give in. And for seven days, your three closest friends have just picked you apart, and told you how you have done something wrong to cause all this. Could you stand up to that? And here's the reason being is, because I think if I'm in Job's place, I would probably be like, you know, I probably did something wrong. I don't know what it is, but I don't know that I could have held to my integrity the way Job holds to his. And tonight, he's going to reintroduce that back in that, hey, I am not out of line here. I have not done anything wrong. And by the way, we know because of the cheat sheet of chapter 1, he didn't do anything wrong. But the bottom line is his three friends. Can you imagine your life like that? And by the way, whose idea was all this? It wasn't Satan. Satan didn't go, you know what? I'm going to pull out Job. No, God goes, why don't you try him out? So now, Job 27, as we dive into this, we're going to start with Job continues or continued his parable. All right? Now, remember, in verse 27, he says, Moreover, Job continues his parable. And so, remember, two weeks ago when we got into chapter 26, we started talking about what a parable is. And the vast majority of preachers out there today say that a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual truth or a heavenly meaning. The problem is that's not the biblical definition of a parable. A parable is according to the uh, uh, Psalms, a dark saying. Ezekiel 17.2 says it's a riddle. Okay, We come into Matthew and Matthew says it's designed to hide truth from unbelievers, but it's designed to give truth to believers. Okay, And so Jesus designed a parable that way. Now, you say, okay, why are we reviewing all that? 
Well, because God decided to let us know in verse 1 that he's continuing this parable, which means what we are reading, and he's going to do it in chapter 29, verse 1, but what we are reading is a parable. He said, okay, big deal. Which means there is hidden truth for the believer in these chapters, and it's designed to hide the truth from an unbeliever. Now, you go, oh, big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Because that's how God said, I'm writing these chapters. They're going to be in parables. So when we study these things, we must keep that in mind that God ain't just coming out and saying it plainly. He's saying it, and I even hate to use the word, but in code. Because I hate to use that word with the Bible because then people start coming up with all kinds of goofiness that God supposedly said, and he didn't. Because they you know, took the first letter of the you know, first chapter of the... 17 first books and all of a sudden God's got some secret design in there and I don't believe that. Now, so let's look at this. He said, as God liveth, this is verse 2, who hath taken away my judgment. Okay, now, what he's saying here is he's not saying like taking away the judgment that was coming towards me. What he's been saying is the whole time, I want my day in court. I want to meet with God. I want my day to stand before the court systems And God has taken that away from me. Now, all he's begged for, he hasn't cursed God, he hasn't done anything, he hasn't said anything foolish uh, with his lips, none of that. What he has done is came in here and literally said, I just want to meet with God. And God, for whatever reason, hasn't given him that opportunity. Now, that's important. Because you've been taught all throughout Christianity in America that if you live for Jesus, life goes well. Right? Come to Jesus, your life will get better. You ever study church history? The vast majority of people in church history, in order for them to come to know Jesus, their life didn't get better. Their life stunk. They were mutilated. They were persecuted. Their families were persecuted. They were run out of towns. Listen, to this very day, there are 120 known Saudis to be believers in this world. 120. You know why that is? Because if you are in Saudi Arabia and you say, Hey, I just asked Jesus into my heart. Off comes your head. So how can you go in there and go, Well, just come to Jesus. Your life will get better. Okay, well... And the other dumb thing we act and and say to people is, well, if you come to Jesus, he'll work it all out. Well, in the end, he will. But your current state may get worse. And the fact is, we all have been trained to think, oh, my life should be going good because I'm a believer. Says who? Matter of fact, God lets you know if you really live for me, life's going to stink. You're going to suffer persecution. Everything's going to work against you. Now, hang with me. He says, I just want my day in court and God's taking it away. And then he goes on, he says, the Almighty who hath vexed my soul. Who vexed his soul? God, right? Now, you say, wait a minute, Satan that's doing this to him. Job just don't know it. You're right, it's Satan doing it. Who told Satan to do it? So let me ask you something. Are you cool with the Savior who died on the cross with you using the forces of hell to put you into a position that your life stinks to see if you'll stay faithful to Him? This brand of Christianity doesn't go well in America. But that's a biblical brand of Christianity that just because you come to know Jesus as your Savior doesn't mean your life's just going to be awesome. And matter of fact, sometimes it isn't Satan slapping you around. Sometimes it's God. Sometimes it's God that's vexing your soul. The issue isn't whether your soul is going to get vexed or not. The issue is, are you going to remain faithful to God in the midst of all that? Whether it's God putting you to the test or whether it's Satan. Now, we have a group of people that run around here and say this dumb statement. And I think my ministry will eventually be defined as just ripping apart what dumb Baptist preachers say. And one of them is, God will never put you through anything that you're not able to handle. 
Where's that? Where's that in the Bible? Watch this. 1 Corinthians 10.13 is what they're talking about. The problem is they're misquoting it. Listen to the verse. There had no temptation. What's a temptation? It's attempting to sin, right? Would you agree? Okay, now watch this. He said, to taking you uh, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. The context is not suffering. The context is not vexing your soul. The context is not making you go through troubles and trials. The context is about sin, and what he's saying is, no, 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 no. In every situation you go through, if you do sin, it's because you chose to do it, because I made a way of escape for you, and you chose not to take it. However, when you think about, will God put me through things that I'm not able to handle? Every day of my life. Now watch. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Okay, we got Paul, the apostle, right? And he says, For least I, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation. In other words, he's saying, because all this stuff was given to me to give to the Gentile church, it would be really easy to get a big head, right? Like all of us preachers suffer with that. Every now and then, uh, you know, you get up in a pulpit and you just bring it home and everybody's like, man, that's the bomb. And you're like, yeah, I know. And you're feeling really good about yourself. And about two to three sermons later, God just jerks the carpet out from under you and you fall flat on your face. And what is he doing? Letting you know while you're laying down there, it's me that does this, not you. Now, bottom line is, because of this, Paul said, because I had that tendency to get the big head, he said, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buff me. I, God sent a messenger of Satan to his biggest number one man to bother him. Now watch. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, what thing is it? Okay, he says, I besought the Lord thrice meaning three times that it might depart from me so whatever it was whatever that ailment was and everybody wants they spend their whole life trying to figure out what do you think it was who cares his grace is the star of the show not the buffering right now bottom line is he begged god three times to take it away and god says tough my grace is sufficient in other words, here, Paul, I know you can't deal with it. Lean on me. I'll deal with it. So when you think God, that people say, well, God's never going to put me through something I can't handle. Really? There's Moses. Now, can you imagine being Moses? And you, you have left out and you've got the Egyptian army chasing you. And God says, don't go that way. I want you to go this way. And you end up at a well of water. And God says, uh, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, do you think Moses could have said, nah, God, I got this. Moses was thinking to himself, I don't know what we're going to do. There's this massive body of water, and there's an army coming to kill us. We're trapped. And God says, yeah, I know. I put you in that position because only I can solve this. The problem with American brand of Christianity is we think, no, I got it, God. I'll let you know if I need you. And God's simply saying every day of your life, the reason I have to run you through the ringer is so you will stop leaning on yourself and lean on me. And so the ideology of you thinking, ah, God ain't going to put me through that. Yes, he will. And, and, and if God has this ideology of not putting you and I through those things, then he owes a bunch of people some apologies. Because people sit there and watch during the dark ages, the Roman Catholic Church mutilate Bible believers and mutilate their kids right in front of them. 
And so if you and I think so highly of ourselves that God wouldn't do that to us, you misunderstand the God of the Bible. He is all grace. He is all love. But he is running the show. And he's still God, whether your life stinks or whether it's awesome. No, it never changes. And listen, let's just be honest. He doesn't owe you and I anything. If he never does another thing for me, I still owe him everything. Because he saved me from a place called hell that I should be in right now. And for all of us to think, no, nah, I, you know, God ain't, God never do that to me. All right? Verse 3, and all the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now, once again, it's interesting that he is using the same terminologies of Genesis 7. And the reason I bring this out is do you understand when Job says this, there is no Genesis 7. Moses writes that years later. But he knew what went down in the garden that day when God breathed breath into mankind and he became a living soul. Now, if you went through body, soul, and spirit with me and studied, uh, I, I literally did that study because our family pet had died. And I, I'm like, okay, what, what goes down here? Because if you think, so here's how it breaks down. We all have bodies. We all have souls. We all have spirit. Okay, what, what makes this us? Uh, you know, the body we have is unique to everybody else in here, right? It's, it's the machine or the, the mechanical part that moves you around. The spirit that gives you life came from God, but your soul is the unique you. It's who you are. It's what makes you different than everybody else. It, it's, it's your character. It's, it's how you act. It's who you are. And, and I looked at these, this cat we lost and he was so unique that I'm like, he can't just be body and spirit. And so through a big study, we realized that, okay, animals have body, souls, and spirit too. The difference is they don't have the living breath of God in them, so therefore they have a soul, but they don't have an eternal soul. Therein lies the difference. Now, that's just a little side note. Now, the reason we always come back to this, now, just a little side note, because your boy down in Pensacola, he's, he's with the Lord now, used to teach from here, and along with the guy that used to be up in Kansas City, and the boy down the street, all of them teach that you actually don't become a living soul until you take your first breath after birth. I have a problem with that. And they quote this verse. Here's the problem when you quote Genesis 2-7 to tell about how we were born. Which one of you were formed from the ground? So you're going to compare your birth to the same as Adam's? Which one of you were pulled from a rib? No, we had this unique thing that started with Cain and Abel, and that's being birthed out of our mother's womb. And I will forever instill that the Bible clearly teaches that the life of the living soul of a human being gets in there long before they come out of a birth canal. And that God forbid something would happen with Morgan right now with with their child that will soon be here, I am 100% completely satisfied scripturally that if something happened, they would see that child again. You say, you have no proof of that. Really? What do you think David said? I can't bring the child back, but I can go to him. And he wasn't born like this. So your boy Pete, you got Jeff and your guy down the road don't have a clue. All right? Now, number two. So Job's solid position of his integrity. All right? Now watch. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. And he's right. The whole time, Job is not sin with his lips. God has even clarified that to us. Okay? And he goes and he says... 
Uh, God forbid that I should justify you, talking about his friends. Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast. Now, let's just agree this sounds a little cocky, doesn't it? I'm righteous before God. He's going to later on down in chapter say that righteousness is the diadem that he wears. Well, wow, Job. Now, if I didn't have chapter 1, I'd go, Job, you're a little cocky, bub. But hang with me. The difference between self-righteousness and the righteousness of God is razor thin. You see this in Christianity all the time. That when we walk with God and His righteousness is placed on us, Versus when we walk in the things of God and we do it to ourselves. Independent Baptists are famous for this. I'm right with God. Why? Well, I don't chew or dip or smoke or drink. or My wife's never wore a pair of pants and we've never missed a... I mean, we got all those rules, right? And we think, I'm right with God. You can do all those things and still not be right with God. Righteousness, true righteousness that we get from God is imputed, according to the book of Romans, onto you. And an easy way to understand this is amputate means to cut off. Imputate means to place on. He amputated your sin and imputated Christ's righteousness on you. And so, (laughs) over the years I've preach this and people get all whacked out but that's all right that's the reason i choose to do that style but i've told people before i'm absolutely perfect in the sight of god i am 100 percent pure before god who are you to say that if you're not you're on your way to hell Now, I am not pure before God because of my own doing. I can't even impress my wife, let alone God. Okay? Therefore, I can't do anything about the righteousness of God, but God imputes it onto me. And yet, here's Job, man. He's saying, hey, hey, hey. I'm walking with God here, boys. Now, I get from a historical standpoint, he's saying, because I don't have an un- unclaimed sin in my life i'm not harboring anything or hiding anything i'm walking pure before god now job 1 8 tells us that he was perfect and upright one that feareth god and escheweth evil all right job 2 9 he still retained his integrity verse 9 all right verse 10 in his in this did job not sin with his lips in all of this So he is walking pure before God, and he can say, I'm walking in the integrity and the justified life of God at this moment. Now, 1 Corinthians 4.3 is a very one that I want to bring out here, because it's kind of a, I brought this up a few weeks ago, uh, and, and I want you to understand, notice here Paul saying, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or man's judgment, yea, I judge not my own self. So he's saying, you think it's a big deal whether you're going to judge me? I don't even judge me. And the reason why Paul's saying, I don't even judge me, is he said, yeah, I think I know my actions. I think I know my heart. But you know what the Bible says about your heart? Desperately wicked. And no man can know it. That's why I've always joked when somebody would stand up and say, I just want to tell you what's on my heart. Don't do that. (laughs) We have no interest in what's on your heart. Okay? Bottom line is, when it says the heart is desperately wicked and no man can know it, well, who can know it? God, right? So even Paul says, I don't even know if my motives were pure. Do you know whether your motives are pure every time you do something? Now, we're just talking about ourselves, right? So if I can't determine whether my motives are pure before God at all times, how in the world am I ever going to decide whether Eddie's are? 
Now, we've got external things that we can judge. I can't judge his heart. I can judge external things. God said you'll know the tree by the fruit it bears. Okay, bottom line is, if a guy is just living like the world, well then, you know what? I can make a determination. And when people say, you shouldn't judge. Okay, well, there, there is a time to judge. Let, let's just take ordaining deacons. What if we just grab the drunk off the street and go, well, we shouldn't judge. <laughs> no. We, we set a guy aside. You know what we do for a while? Six months to a year? We watch him. We critique him. We judge him. Okay, nobody's saying you can't judge. The, co the problem is we can't always know the intent of the heart. You can't know the intent of mine. You just hired a new pastor. How do you know his heart's pure? You don't. You just watch the outside and let God handle the rest. Now, all right, uh, Job's procedure of debate. Now watch this. All right, now remember, back here in chapter 25, Bildad is just six questions that are all rhetorical. And he's saying out these truths that are truths that nobody can debate with. And what he does is he says, because of these things, therefore, you have sin in your life. Huh? How did you jump to that conclusion? Okay, so now what goes down is Job is going to turn around and do the same thing in verses 7 through 12. And he says, let my enemy be as the wicked, and he that riseth up against me as the unrighteous. Now, do you know who he's talking to? <laughs> he's literally talking to his friends. Let them be as the wicked and the unrighteous. Now, remember, the last verse he just said, I am righteous. And because you guys are going against me, you're unrighteous. Like that? It's a showdown, folks. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he gain, uh, he hath gain when God take away his soul? Now, what does that remind you of? Jesus comes into the New Testament, and he even talks about what a man shall give in exchange for his soul. If you gain the whole world and lose your own soul. And here's what Job, and it's, it's, that's one of the reasons I love this book. Here's Job before there's a Bible written saying a lot of the exact same things that we see in the New Testament. And he's saying, oh, you can gain the whole world. What are you going to do when God comes up, takes away your soul? What do you got left? The most valued thing tangibly you have is your soul. And for those that don't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, what they've essentially done is cashed in everything at the risk of their soul. I mean, what else is at stake? It's all you have is your soul, and it's literally in the balance of whether or not you accept Christ or you reject Christ. Because anything except a full exception of Christ as your personal Savior, your soul ends up in hell. He goes on, Will God hear his cry when the trouble cometh upon him? Uh, chapter 1 of Proverbs, speaking of wisdom, said that when the day of calamity comes, God's going to laugh. Now you say, well that's horrible that God would do that. No, because God sent his son to be butchered on a cross for you to come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and if you reject that, you deserve whatever's coming to you. You do. Because He loved you so much, He died for you, and, and came to this world, lived a sinless life, so He could exchange lives with you, and you say, I have no interest in that. Well, then you got everything coming to you then. All right? He goes on. He says, will he always call upon God? In other words, there's going to come a time you're not going to have the opportunity. I will teach you by the hand of God that that which is with the Almighty I will not conceal. Behold, all ye yourselves have seen it. Why then are ye thus altogether vain? He's just ripping into these guys. Okay, now, we're going to close right here. Now, tonight will be shorter than most. I mean we got a little ways to go, but we only have four points. So Job's pontificating on the wicked man. I want you to notice in verse 13, we've got ten verses that we're going to go through. And when we speak of the wicked man, he says, Thus the, 
Thus is the portion of the wicked man. Now remember, he's setting up the context by just calling out his boys. He said, and you guys, you're getting real close to being like the hypocrite. You're getting real close to being like the wicked man and unrighteousness. Now, when we speak of the wicked man, are we talking about the men and women out there in the world who do wickedly? Or are we talking about the Antichrist? And the answer is yes, we're talking about both. Now, you say, well, how can that possibly be that the same verses would describe the wicked man out there and yet describe the Antichrist himself? Okay, it's easy. Because the Antichrist is the icon or the epitome or the culmination of wickedness into one persona. Therefore, that Antichrist is going to be the picture of all wickedness yet even though we have wicked men out there. So when we read these verses and we break them down, we can not only apply them to the guy out there in the world who rejects Christ, but we specifically can apply them to the Antichrist in the time of tribulation. Okay, Which I've told you, the book of Job tells us more about the Antichrist than the book of Revelation. And we've, we've showed that in multiple places. Now watch. This is the portion of the wicked man with God. Now, if you guys will remember back in Job 29, when El uh, Eliphaz was speaking, he said, this is the portion of the wicked man from God. And then that whole chapter uh, there on out throughout the rest of the chapter was about him. You go back to chapter 18, verse 21. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked. This is Job speaking at this time. And so each time we see this come forth, God is laying out some details about that Antichrist who is going to come during the time of tribulation. Now, verse 14. If his, who, the wicked man's children be multiplied, it is for the sword. Now, what do you mean his children? Now we know, according to the book of Daniel, that the Antichrist will have no desire for woman. Now, for most part, most people teach that he's going to be a homosexual. I refuse that one. I teach that he's going to be transgendered. And the reason being is, if you go and, and we're going to study in the book of Job and find out that he is behemoth. And behemoths, the Bible says that the sinew of his stones or his testicles are been, have been sown. In other words, uh, I don't know if he's been castrated or what, or he's just a eunuch or what have you. But given the the circumstances of what you see going on outside that window with transgenderism, I believe the Antichrist is going to be that. Plus, Baphomet, the, the, the goat god that you see, that statue constantly, is both male and female. Okay. By the way, Santa Claus? What is he? It's a guy, right? Why has he got the name Santa or have you never looked into that while you took your kid down there and set him on his lap? <laughs> All right, now, it, it, that's a whole other story. But now notice, his, his children... All right. His children be multiplied. So whose children? The Antichrist. So what are we talking about? We're talking about his kingdom here, right? Okay, and that's not that far of a stretch when we speak about his children or his people... You know, bottom line is, a king that rules over a, a kingdom looks down and says, this is my people. Okay? Now, bottom line is, it's, it's for the sword. Then he noticed the next one. His offspring shall be not satisfied with bread. Same thing. His offspring, his children, doesn't matter. They're, they're going to be uh, multiplied for the sword, and they're not going to be satisfied with bread. Well, let's jump over here to Revelation chapter 6, and let's see if we can figure this thing out. It says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were a, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I, I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth to conquer and conquer. Now, this is the Antichrist himself. Now notice he has a bow, but not an arrow. And when he goes to conquer, he doesn't actually have to do it by war. 
Do you understand when the Antichrist comes? And the next event to happen is the rapture of the church. There could be immediately or some space of time between the rapture and the signing of the peace treaty. The signing of the peace treaty, Daniel 9, 27, is very clear that that's the kickoff of the tribulation. What's the peace treaty? It's the peace treaty between Israel and the Middle East. This guy is going to come in on the scene and not have to fire a shot. And he's going to become a world leader. Okay? He's, that's why. And everybody says, wait, he's coming on a white horse. I thought that was Jesus. Okay? And by the way, a lot of commentaries will tell you that. Here's the problem. He's called the Antichrist. Now some people, it, 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 you understand that the word Antichrist are, means to not only be against Christ, but it's the same word as instead of Christ. Who do you think he's coming as? The whole world is going to point and go, it's Jesus. Okay, So when he comes on the scene, he's mimicking, if you will, or emulating Christ. That's why he's seen coming on a white horse. So the Antichrist comes, right? And it says, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard a second beast say, come and see. And he went out. And there went out another horse that was red. So we had the white horse, the Antichrist. Now we have a red horse. And power was given to him that, that, that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great what? Sword. Now watch this, going back to our verse. His children, the Antichrist, are multiplied. Why? For the sword. Soon as he comes, what's the next horse that comes? The one that brings the sword. Okay, look at the next. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. So now we've had a white, a red, and a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see if thou, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So you know what he's talking about? Famine. They're not going to be satisfied with bread. That's why you can go back here to Job. What's he do? Antichrist comes, red horse brings the sword, black horse brings the famine. Now, you guys see what's going on with eggs? You just had another egg farm blow up with 100,000 chickens gone. Right. Now, I would tell you none of this is by happenstance. And I would also tell you, if you think that's bad now, this is nothing. It is going to get rough. But let me also tell you, what I will live through will not be anything close what goes on here you look guys I, I literally for 16 years i've been teaching the book of revelation in here and i i struggle to find words to describe an event that's undescribable like you can't even begin to explain how bad it's going to be and people are like oh that sounds rough you haven't even thought of the worst situations it's going to happen now verse 15 those that remain of him shall be burned in death here is one of the things that is a misnomer about the tribulation people will live through it now tons of people are going to die no doubt we know that a huge amount of the population will die during the tribulation but people will live through it and many of those that live through it are basically buried in death Meaning there, there is no hope. They've either taken the mark of the beast or they, they've done whatever they've done to get through it, but they have no hope. And as I told you before, if you reject the love of Christ right now, when you have the day of grace and the opportunity that God said in 2 Thessalonians, He would send you a strong delusion to make sure you believed a lie. Not Satan doing it, God doing it. Right? And his widows shall not weep. Now notice the word widows is plural. Once again, it's like ch children. He's not going to be married. He's going to have no desire for a woman. He may think he's a woman for all I know. Right? But at the end of the day, his widows, all these widows of his kingdom shall not weep. Right? Verse 16. 
Though he heap up silver as the dust and prepare raiment as the clay. Now notice here, he's talking about the Antichrist, but we're also talking about the wicked man himself, right? Can you, can you reason that in your head? That as we're breaking down Scripture, we're talking about the Antichrist, yes, but we're also talking about just the wicked man over here, the drug dealer, the, uh, 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 the pedophile, the whatever you want to make him out over here. Notice what he says, Though he heap up silver as dust, prepare raiment as the clay, he may prepare it, who's the he? The wicked man, the Antichrist, but the just shall put it on. And the innocent shall divide the silver. Now this, I want you to hang with me on this verse. If we cross references all the way back to chapter 20, when we, we talked about, we were talking about the wicked man there. And that which was labored shall be restored, and they that shall not swallow it down. According to the, his substance shall the restitution be, and he shall not rejoice therein. Now hang with me. All right. Ecclesiastes says that he's going to heap and gather it up, that it may be given to that is good before God. Okay, Proverbs thirteen twenty two: A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Now, that means you ever drive down and you look at somebody's massive mansion, and my first question is, and we talk about this constantly, what are you doing to generate that kind of monthly income to make that house payment. Like, I, I've, I'm not a genius, but I can do math. And I can go, man, you must do something that's so valuable in this world to generate that kind of money. And you go, man, I don't, I don't know how they do it. And you look around, you go, here I am trying to serve God. I'm struggling. I'm barely getting by. And yet the, the, the sinner down here is just rejoicing in all that he has. And God says, uh, hang tight. Because by the time this is over, all that wealth, it's going to the just man. I'm going to let him gather it up, but he's not going to get to use it. And, and, and you think to yourself, what? Now hang with me. So if you guys were here Sunday morning, Justin talked about work, right? Working with your own hands. And he, got, he took you back to Genesis and let you know that God instituted work for Adam to do before sin ever entered in the world. Work is not a curse. What God cursed was the results of the work. Okay, So God intended for mankind to work even before sin got into town. Okay, Now, the reason that's important is because you have it in your ideology that, oh, we're going to get raptured out here, we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to come back with Christ and help Him rule and reign for a thousand years. That's right. But do you think you're going to be sitting on a beach with a palm leaf by some angel or some sinner blowing you down while you're drinking virgin mac daiquiris? I mean, that's not what's going to go down. Ruling and reigning with Christ will actually require work. And you're going to be brought back to the very planet you're on right now. And when God takes this planet through the tribulation, when you come back to it, you understand it's going to be a junkyard? Who's cleaning it up? The servants? Yeah. You. You. Okay, so bottom line is, but, but don't freak out because God says, yeah, you know all that riches and all them gold, all that silver, all that raiment, all that stuff, it's yours. That's why he said, I'm going to let them all pile it up and I'm going to give it to the just man. All right, now, which is interesting because some of them people are going to live through this. Now, verse 18, he buildeth his house as a moth. Now, a moth's house, there it is, okay? Now notice, it's, it's very intricate if you study it. But it's also very delicate and can be blown away with just simply with the wind. That's literally the Antichrist kingdom. A very intricate system that he is going to build, and by the time it's over with, God's going to blow it away. All right? Now, he goes on, he says, not only is it like a, 
a house of a mop, but he says, as a booth that the keeper maketh. Now, the booth was a shack that was out in the vineyard or out in the field, and it's where the caretaker lived. He lived in a booth, and God says, yeah, by the time this is all over with, he's going to be down there in a shack where it's at. Isaiah 1.18, it says, And the daughters of Zion is left as a cottage, there's the word, in a vineyard, or as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. In other words, just out here in a patch of cucumbers. That's what he's living in. Right? Job 27.19, The rich man shall lie down, but he shall not be gathered. He opened his eyes, and he is not. Now hang with me. If you understand the terminology or the the verbiage that God is using here, he shall not be gathered. Watch this. Okay, you remember in the Old Testament when saints of God would die, the Bible said that they were gathered unto their people. What did that mean? It means when they died, they went into Old Testament paradise. And so when Isaac died, he went into the center of the earth in Old Testament paradise and he was with his dad, Abraham. And when his sons died, or one of the sons for sure, died, he entered in to the Old Testament paradise, and he was gathered onto his people. Now, physically, we know they were gathered in a, in a grave together, but that gathering onto his people was his soul went in there. But the rich man, he says, the rich man uh, will lie down, and he shall not be gathered onto his people. Where's the rich man end up? In hell. And he opens up his eyes. Now watch this. He opens his eyes and he is not. He's not anymore. His soul is reduced to nothing but a worm inside of a place called hell. And that's where he's spending eternity. Now, Verse 20 and 21, terrors take hold on him, talking about the Antichrist again, as water. All right, now, notice here in Job 18, 11, it says, terror shall make him afraid on every side and shall drive him to his feet. Now, understand, for the first three and a half years of the tribulation, things are going good. Considering. Peace and safety, they've got figured out, right? But the Bible says that when peace and safety they got, sudden destruction is going to hit them. And so now, for the first three and a half years, there is a human being known as the Antichrist who's probably a transgender. But about halfway, people start turning against him. And what happens is he ends up living in terror. We saw this back in chapter 18. And he holds on, holds on to water. Tempest stealeth him away in the night. The east wind carrieth him away, and he departeth. What's, what's departing? What does it mean when somebody departs? They're dying, right? Hang with me. Now, the east wind, everywhere you see it in the Word of God, every time you see it, it is connected with the coming judgment of God. What's going down with this guy? The judgment of God's going to hit him. Now, hang with me. Verse 14 of chapter 18, if you remember... His confidence shall be rooted out of his tabernacle, and he shall and it shall bring him to the king of terrors. Now watch. Going back to our verse, he's going to depart as a storm whirleth him out of his place. Now, this is one of the examples, most of you know it, but those on YouTube, I'm a King James guy through and through. And we can we can have a whole discussion on why that is. But key words and phrases are the main reason we use it, okay? What I can do in between Genesis and Revelation, you can't do with a modern Bible. And the bottom line is God lays out key words and phrases in his book, and this, his place. Now, we're talking about the Antichrist, right? If you go back to the book of Acts, you got 11 disciples left, right? Because Judas is gone. Peter stands up and he says, uh, we probably need to take a vote, replace Judas, who went to his own place, right? Okay, where did Judas go when he died? Hell. Okay, Revelation 9, the earth opens up and there's a king that comes up out of this bottomless pit called Abaddon Apollyon. It's also known as 
perdition or the son of perdition. Who's the son of perdition? Judas. Okay? When Judas comes up out of chapter 9, he's coming up out of his place. Now, that is the prophetical term of his place. But let's talk about his other place. Let's talk about your place. Where do I live? Right? So I talked to you earlier today about my body, soul, and spirit, right? Who's the real me? The soul, right? Because I'm getting a new body, but I'm still going to be me. Bottom line is, this is my place. This is where I live, right? Okay, now watch. His confidence, this is comparing Scripture to Scripture, His confidence shall be rooted out of His tabernacle, His body. And it shall bring Him to the King of terrors. And it shall, it shall dwell in His tabernacle because it is none of His. Brimstone shall be scattered upon His habitation. So here's what's going down here. And many of you guys have heard me teach this a thousand times. For three and a half years, there is a man who is born of a human woman on this planet. He is human, and he is going to be the Antichrist. And at some point, the King of Terrors is going to come, and he is going to depart from his place. He is going to be, look at the word, rooted out of his tabernacle. Meaning, the soul of him is leaving out, going to hell. The body is going to lay there on the ground. And after three days, Satan and Judas are going to enter inside that body and they are going to rise it back up. And you go, this is the craziest stuff I've ever heard. <laughs> Have you read the Bible? Have you read it? Like, let's just be honest. Pick me a spot that isn't crazy. You realize Every one of us are here tonight to worship a God you cannot see. And you're called on a guy who died 2,000 years ago on a cross. And you get up hopefully every day and you talk to him. Me, I do it in my truck while I'm driving down the road. Luckily in today's world, people just assume you're on the phone. <laughs> 20 years ago, they'd have thought, who's he talking to? Right? But the bottom line is, He's going to be brought back up and he's going to walk around, but it's not him anymore. It's Satan inside of him. And so for the next three and a half years, and this is why I can't get down with the three and a half year tribulation issue. There has to be seven years, homeboys. Like where are you fitting all that in? Right? Now, bottom line is that's what goes down at midway. Now look at verse 20. Too. For God shall cast upon him and not spare, and he shall fain flee out of his hand. Now, this, for God shall cast upon him. It's, it's another way of God's going to throw down on him. In other words, when God strikes him with judgment, he's not going to spare. I can't wait to see all this. Do you understand at the end of the tribulation, when Jesus finally lays him out, you're standing there with him. Or sitting on a horse with him. I don't, I, don't know how, I don't know if we unsaddle or what we do. But we're there. And I'm, I can't wait. All right? Now, verse 23, and we'll close. Men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. There it goes again. Out of his place. So at three and a half years in, this Antichrist is no longer going to be celebrated. Matter of fact, Babylon, which is going to be celebrated at the first part, is not going to be celebrated at the end. And they're going to, notice here, clap their hands and hiss at him. Now I want you to notice this, comparing Scripture to Scripture. So, uh, Lamentations 2.15, All that pass by clap their hands at thee, they hiss and wag their head. Okay. Now this hissing and the clapping of the hands in the oriental... Uh, um, mindset was like we would do with booing right like if we don't like somebody we boo him if justin was here i would explain that if me and him would go down to atlanta to watch his boy seth curry i would boo i sent him a picture today and said you need new heroes 
But that's what they're talking about. It's not the, it's not, we boo it, but they would hiss and clap. The whole world is going to turn against this guy by the time it's over. But it's going to be too late. They already bought into his deal. So I, I told you I'd be short. It's five minutes short. So <laughs> God bless you. Uh, and please sign up for the Valentine's thing. You're, you're making life miserable. All right? Sign up. Get that there. Get us the pictures. So God bless you.